Great. So today I'm going to be speaking about uh, our work in environmental modeling and how we're able to leverage satellite-based data sets to improve exposure modeling and the implications for environmental epidemiology. The premise of this is that getting exposures right matters, that when we're trying to reconstruct environmental exposures, we have to remember that the temperature outside, the quality of the air that we breathe, it changes dynamically. It can change over short distances and it can change very rapidly. And I think, you know, some areas saw that quite dramatically at the start of the pandemic with really big shifts in uh, you know, behaviors and commercial traffic and things like that, and not everyone. And also, um, you know, we've made many assumptions when we're when we've started the the field of uh, understanding the impacts of extreme temperature. You know, a lot of work has been based on data sets that are really grounded in uh, where the local airports are, because that's where the weather stations were. Um, and most of us are not, thankfully, living at the airport. So you can have su substantial variation in, uh, in temperature. We, we've heard of the phrase, the urban heat island, but in fact, there's much more structure than that. There's an urban heat archipelago, a term that's also been used for several decades. There's, there's substantial variation, you know, even just thinking about uh, block to block. And so how do, we, uh, how do we model that and then bring that into our studies to understand what people are really experiencing, where they live, go to go to school, where they sleep, et cetera. We need accurate estimates. And so my group builds geostatistical models using satellite data. And then we're investigating the implications of having improvements. You know, what is it, what is the impact of reducing measurement error or, you know, thinking about having models that have less bias? When we're using satellite data, we use several different kinds of uh, things that can be measured Am I the ones that's supposed oh, no, to don't admit? OK, <clears throat> so we're using several different kinds of satellite data, and then we're combining that with what we be, might be termed land use regressor, land use regression predictors. So from the satellite data, one uh, parameter that we use a lot is, is a product called aerosol optical depth, which is the amount of light scattering related to particles in the entirety of the atmospheric column. And one of the limitations of this problem is that humans, we're mostly doing our breathing in the bottom two meters of the atmospheric column. And if you have a lot of suspended particles highly aloft, what you may end up with is a beautiful sunset. But if it doesn't mix down to the surface, then you're not necessarily going to breathe it. And so we have an imperfect proxy, right? Satellites are able to, to see that there's um, this light scattering, right, that, that what the sun's rays don't bounce directly back to the, to the satellite, but they're not necessarily able to directly tell us what we're interested in, which is what, what am I going to breathe down at the ground level? Um, another parameter that we use from satellites is called land surface temperature. So uh, thermal infrared remote sensing capabilities um, allow satellites to measure the skin temperature, the temperature of the top few millimeters of whatever the, is the first thing that the sun's uh, rays hit, whether that's uh, bare soil or building rooftops or the tr uh, tree canopy. But what we're experiencing when we walk around is, is an air temperature, which isn't exactly the same thing as surface temperature. The relation between those is complicated, right? Because, you know, it depends... Um, you know, various thermal properties of, of radiant energy and, you know, whether there's wind and, and those kinds of things. Um, and then a, a third parameter that we're very interested in um, that satellites have done for a long time because of their applications in meteorology is column water vapor, the amount of water that would precipitate out. And that uses principles of spectroscopy, where the these satellites um, have sensors that look for the absorption uh, in very specific wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum that that relate to um, water. And so, you know, because of the uh, intense interest in meteorologic applications, satellites are very good at quantifying uh, water vapor. But of course, um, we see some opportunities to think about the relation of humidity and human health. Um, again, though, like the aerosol optical depth, the column water vapor is, is most often something that's for the whole atmospheric column, right? And we're, um, we're living here just in the bottom two meters. 
So um, in all of these cases, we're getting these parameters from satellites, mostly NASA, NOAA, uh, USGS, European Space Agency satellites. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities in satellite data specifically. So what we're, what we're doing is we're layering different kinds of information. So this is from some work that we did in Mexico City. Now, Mexico City, uh, you know, had a legacy of, of very, very bad air pollution. It's been improving over the years. And they, a number of years ago, installed some air quality monitors. So they're measuring, you know, daily uh, concentrations of fine particulate matter, PM 2.5, with aerodynamic, uh, aerodynamic diameters less than 2.5 microns. But it's a pretty sparse network. You just have a few monitors throughout the city, right? And there's a huge populace. And, and one of the characteristics of, that makes Mexico City a, a mega city is that you know, it, it's sort of sprawled out from the original administrative district. So on top of that ground monitoring network in a land use regression, you might layer on other kinds of information that's relevant particularly to the spatial distribution of sources of air pollution. So maybe you would put in information there about uh, road networks or their utilization or traffic, um, some information about land use, uh, population density, think about you know, where the businesses are and things like that. Maybe you would have some temporally varying uh, features like uh, meteorology, right? To understand what are the conditions under which you have uh, more secondary organic aerosol formation and things like that. And this is kind of how land use regression is often done. And now we're layering on top of that, this spatio-temporal layer from the satellite remote sensing. So, you know, uh, a typical polar orbiting satellite might go overhead every day. You get a snapshot, you know, at the moment that that satellite goes overhead, there are also a set of satellites I'll talk about that are geostationary. So they're orbiting um, further up, right? And so they have to kind of zoom more if you think about the lens on the camera. But a geostationary um, satellite will always be over the same longitude. And so it can take many snapshots over the course of a day. We'll, we'll talk about a pretty cool um, set of geostationary satellites. So we're combining this kind of information and we use a geostatistical framework, which means that we're learning relationships where we have ground data so that we can try to infer uh, using predictive modeling what's happening where we do not have ground data. Some of the technical challenges are that these data sources include just staggering data volumes. You know, NASA is it has this uh, sort of planetary mission. They're producing data sets uh, that go around the world. They're in um, sometimes esoteric formats, and there's just an enormous amount of it. Uh, there's an incredible amount of missingness. So you really have to think about why is it that these data are missing? Aerosol optical depth, that light scattering, it can be missing for, for a number of reasons, but two of the most important ones are that it's nighttime um, and I continue to breathe at night and I, I hope that all of you do as well. And so that's a problem for us because we're mostly getting information uh, during you know, the time that things are going overhead. We also don't get it when there are clouds because we need um, light to be bouncing off the surface. Um, and we're not getting any information indoors and indoors has incredibly important sources of, of air pollution. Now, ambient air pollution is right now what we're regulating in the US and we know that there's a strong relation between ambient concentrations and human health. It's still relevant, but boy, do I wish you know NASA would develop something that would peak um, indoors. They won't. Okay. Um, you know, I think one of the other challenges, and I'm, I'm not going to go into it so much today, but it's really um, almost like an earth science challenge, is that there's enormous measurement error. So those products that I mentioned, AOT, AOD, land surface temperature, and column water vapor, they're, um, they're generated through physics-based algorithms that are known as retrievals, right? Which is, you know, using the properties of how light scatters or how, you know, thermal energy disperses, right? They're they're doing their best to infer what the what the um, what the truth is, but these are really indirect observations. They're they're um, and and then we talked about how they could be for the entire column. So they're they're both uh, measurement error. You know, they're themselves noisy, and then they're not measuring directly the quantities that we're most interested in. So I have a big project that I'd be happy to talk about another time, where we're using machine learning to clean up some of these retrievals with really really fascinating results. Where we're able to really improve aerosol optical depth, um, and we're developing some some software that we're going to release um, uh, that that I think is is going to um, well, I have a lot of fun with that part, um, 
although that's upstream of the applications to human health. So um, one of the first projects that I worked on was we, we built the uh, a spatio-temporal model at a one kilometer resolution for Mexico City um, over a, the course of a couple years. And you know, this model allowed us to leverage health data where we had information on um, cohorts of participants who had signed up for, for human health studies. You know, we knew where they lived. And so the, the, the basic mechanism of assigning exposures of what we think people would breathe on average where they live is based on a linkage from your residential address history. So the process is that if you're you know, prospectively enrolling people in a study, you ask them about where they live, you stay up to date on whether they move, right? Or perhaps you're doing this a little bit retrospectively and you're asking them, where have you lived? When did you move, right? Now, you don't necessarily, it's not so easy to remember all the addresses where you've ever lived, go through a credit check, you'll, this is a, a challenge. But in general, you know, if you can keep track of where people live, you start to link things in based on place, based on where they are. So this model, um, this kind of got me started in this field. And then um, you know, we started doing things that were more complicated, more sophisticated, and, and building up you know, bigger and bigger projects. So this is from a paper that was uh, led by Daniel Carrion when he was a, a postdoc um, at Mount Sinai, where we built a model uh, of temperature that was hourly at a one kilometer resolution over the northeastern and mid-Atlantic states of the US. And you see here on the right, you know, a geostatistical model is predicated on being able to train. You need some truth. So the ground truth that we used here was a network of data that's maintained by um, NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. So we have lots of these ground stations. And what you do is you, you train with that and you withhold some of them, right? And we use a process called cross-validation. In this case, we used a spatial cross-validation. So we said, how well would we do at this station if we knew nothing about what was going on around here, just inferring the concentration, the um, temperature at that location with the other information that we've trained into this model. And, and here you see a list of some of the inputs that we use um, on the left, the kind of predictor space uh, to, to kind of reconstruct what's happening at this, at this NOAA um, set of stations. And then we compared a bunch of different uh, predictive modeling approaches. So we said, you know, how well can you do with sort of a simplistic geostatistical interpolation called inverse distance weighting. What about if we you know, augment that with uh, ordinary least squares regression? What if we start doing mixed effects because we say you know, the relationship between, um, between the, you know, the, the satellite-based measurement and what's happening on the ground, that can vary day to day depending on sort of meteorology and other things. Well, what if we start using generalized additive models and we have smoothers so we can borrow information across space or across space time? Um, and finally, what we found works really well in our hands is a gradient boosting, which is a form of tree-based models where you're um, really able to accommodate complex relationships between these predictors. That there's certain circumstances where, you know, um, if you've got a lot of inbound radiant energy and you've got a lot of, you know, surface pavement, right? Then, you know, th there's going to be these kinds of um, interactions, right? That we would think of interactions that are occurring in that predictor space that help better explain um, this dependent variable. So um, we built this uh, hourly model and, and here's kind of a zoom in on what New York City looked like. Um, this is a uh, midnight. So at nighttime, you know, nighttime is a very important time for us because people need the physiologic respite of being able to cool themselves at night. And um, nighttime is also very important when you're using place-based exposure because that's when people are home, right? And they give you their, their home address. So you've got this confluence where people are, are in their residence, their home, but they're not necessarily able to get relief, particularly in these urban heat islands where you have dense, um, you know, uh, surface materials, and and you know it, they hold on to that heat during the day, and then they just don't cool down as much at night. So this is kind of zooming in, and you see the island of Manhattan here in the middle of my slide, and then we overlaid on this these uh, larger grid cells, this rectangle. These represent the grid cells of the North American Land Data Assimilation System, NLDAS2, which is a, a popular NASA product. It's what you would get um, when you were to, if you were to go to the CDC's Heat and Health website, and the Environmental Public Health Tracking um, website, to, to look at 
sort of climate related heat indicators. Um, so the NLDAS too, it's, it's a great product. It, you know, covers the US. It gives us lots of information about this historic exposure, but it's, it's pretty coarse. So these larger um, rectangles here are like 11 by 14 kilometers. And what you see is that you're, you're basically lumping, you know, most people on the island of Manhattan are, are falling into, you know, one grid cell right? And, you know, when I lived in, in Washington Heights, you know, kind of close to the middle of that, I wished on summer days that I were in the middle of the Hudson, but I wasn't, you know, it's, it's kind of different there. So you, you lose out on that granularity, that spatial resolution. And what Daniel showed in, in his paper is that we were able to get much better uh, predictive accuracy. So here we use the root mean squared error as a metric of how well we're doing um, in our cross-validation performance. And, and if you want to compare it proportionally, you should use the mean squared error. So we've got, you know, a third of the mean squared error of that NLDAS2, but I'll talk about the implication also of this sort of finer spatial resolution of being able to drill down on the neighborhoods where people live. I think anytime anyone tries to add to the zoom, I have to click on the screen again. Okay, so we built that, you know, and now that's on the left, that's the temperature model. We also had a daily uh, Northeast PM 2.5 model where we're starting to cover these broader regions. And once you start to cover broader regions, it also lets you link not just to these cohorts in like the one in Mexico City where people have specifically enrolled and, you know, you, you've got a few hundred or a few thousand people. You can start to link into um, registries, you know, population-based data sets. You can start to link into de demographic information, thinking about pulling uh, social variables from sources like the uh, American Community Survey, ACS, or the Census Bureau, uh, other data sets like that. And um, so, you know, on the right, it's a daily model because the EPA is, you know, mandating under the National Ambient Air Quality Standards that uh, state and local agencies measure 24-hour concentrations of PM 2.5. So we're using that as our dependent variable, sort of midnight to midnight. And again, one of the challenges there of, of you know, how informative can satellite data be, right? They're not telling you anything about what's going on at night, right? Which is, again, a time when I like to continue breathing. So we've got these predictive models. I gave you some examples, Mexico and then the Northeast. Um, we can do uh, this reconstruction for the temperature model. We built it hourly, which is giving us information also about sort of how much the temperature can vary within a day, right? And you start to see that you know, you you can have um, you can have asymmetry, right? It can it can get hot and stay hot, or it can change very rapidly. You know, there are these dynamics, and that that NLDAS two it is also hourly, but they're interpolating from a um, underlying uh, North American regional reanalysis that really is a three hour time step, right? So maybe part of a, uh, what we're doing is that we're actually finer resolution in both time and space. And we have these flexible machine learning models. We, we're using XGBoost, but you also have to be really careful um, to avoid overfitting because all your data is coming from the same set of ground stations. And so different uh, subsets of those data are not independent, right? Once you know that a station is in a neighborhood that runs hot or has higher air pollution, right? That, that That's kind of an attribute Right, and so you have to be careful because there's this important structure and non-independence in the training data, and you have to think about how to reflect that in your predictive modeling. Right, your your observations are not independent, um, identically distributed. So we we have this uh, paper from 2020 that was really about some of the challenges here, and then another one is in evaluating your model. Um, we we tend to put our meteorologic stations and our our air pollution monitoring they're much more prevalent in urban areas, right? That's that's where a lot of the people live, of course, but it means that when you test your, uh, when you evaluate your model, um, some models kind of, uh, you know, just borrow information across town, right? And it's, it's harder to know, is this model appropriate everywhere? And we really were concerned, particularly about building a model that would do well where you don't have data from stations. So we've thought a lot about ways to um, use weighting and other approaches to really evaluate how well do we do when you're not near a station? How well do you do when you're in a suburb or you're in a rural area, right? Much of the United States lacks uh, adequate ground monitoring. That's why we're building these models. So um, since then, uh, with some support from uh, NIH's uh, ECHO program, they had an opportunity and infrastructure fund. Um, we started building out national models. 
And so we built um, a national model for PM 2.5, and then I'll show you one for temperature. So on the left here is, um, you know, averaging the, the daily PM 2.5 across uh, meteorologic seasons in 2019. And this is a, a national model. And on the right, um, this is a, an example of zooming into the, the New York City area on the day that had the um, median air pollution concentrations for 2021 in this region, right? So we wanted this to be somewhat typical. And this model, um, you'll start to notice when you when you look on the right, but I'll show you a little bit later, um, we, we actually switched some of our modality so that instead of focusing on this kind of rasterized or gridded data, we started to build in both gridded information and continuous fields. And now we're making point-based predictions. So we're able to really take advantage if you have someone's residential address, if you geocode it, which is the process of converting an address into its latitude and longitude, we're able to then make a prediction that we think is specific to that location. And that's really unique among um, large spatiotemporal models. They, they tend to be gridded. And so this is what it looks like for mean temperature um, on, on one day from our, our national temperature model. And this is sort of zooming in on New York City on that same day, but just note that the two color scales are reset to be um, sort of region specific on the span of colors that you can see. And, and if, you, if you're familiar with Manhattan, you can see even in the, in the middle of the city there um, that, that we see that there's a tiny little bit of relief around uh, Central Park, right? Where you have uh, dense uh, vegetation that's somewhat rectilinear there. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about resolution and its implications, but I want to uh, move on from the models in a second. In a second, so these models are, are highly performant, and I'll give you some examples of how they compare to other models. They're recent and updatable, so so far they're through the end of 2021, but we're able to continue to add time to them. Um, uh, you know that's been a challenge for other models because, um, for example, it, many PM 2.5 models rely on the EPA's national emissions inventory, right, where you have a large industrial or point source um, industrial actors have to report their emissions, right, and then those all get pulled together into this emissions inventory, which is always released with a several year lag, right, so it's very hard to, to be able to predict you know, using that kind of information if you want to be up to date, and, and we're not using that information. That lets us, you know, bring our, our models up to date so that we can be responsive to changing conditions, and it's, it's particularly useful when people have these kinds of cohorts or ongoing studies. You know, they, they say, like, I need to be able to show the results of this study, you know, in less than five years. I need to be able to uh, apply this. Yeah. So the question was, how far back does it go? We um, started our models in the beginning of 2003. Um, and that's sort of an era that, that's um, maybe a golden age for this satellite remote sensing. We rely on the sensors uh, that are known as MODIS, which are very popular uh, spectrometers that are aboard two NASA satellites, Terra and Aqua, which went up in roughly 2000 and, and late 2002. So we went back to January of 2003. We've done models back to 2000, but 2003 is really a nice sweet spot because there's lots of ground data, which is really relevant if you're gonna do a geostatistical model. And we have this sort of modern satellite era. There are newer satellites, which I'll talk about at the end, um, and they unlock new capabilities, but they don't go back quite so far in time. So there's always these trade-offs. Sometimes I get questions about the 1990s. You know, of course, there was higher air pollution concentrations and more variability, which would improve statistical power and give you uh, really relevant information if you're at a different part of the exposure response curve. But if we didn't have satellites, this particular approach, you know, you'd have to go back to other other things. So we um, we have this daily model. It starts in 2003. For now, it goes through the end of 2021, but we're continuing to update it. And um, the still improving part here is that you know we're able to integrate new ideas into this model. We've built it out as a completely automated pipeline, data processing through machine learning. So um, that means that when new information is released, you know when the uh, Environmental Protection Agency releases the air quality system information for another year, right? We're just able to, you know, put that into the pipeline and let the machine go. Um, and I have some really nice servers and that helps. So I want to give some, some brief empirical comparisons, although I think it's more interesting to get to the implications of having better models. 
So um, one of the models that we compare with is the EPA's fused air quality surfaces with downscaling. So the EPA takes a 12 kilometer resolution chemical transport model called CMAC. Um, and so this runs, you know, they can run CMAC across the US. Um, and they, you know, the problem with a chemical transport model is they're, they're trying to get at sort of the, the physics of how things, uh, you know, react and move, but sometimes the values that come out of it, you know, can have big differences from the ground truth. And so the fused air quality surfaces uses a Bayesian approach to downscale that by tying it to the actual concentrations that were measured with these air quality system monitors. And one of the nice things about the EPA's product is that they release this, they have a tracked level. So census tracts are pretty small um, in terms of you know, US population units. They have a tracked level product that's national, that's daily, and they release this. And so that, that created a really nice benchmarking opportunity for us because we're able to compare them. And also importantly, it's always hard to compare uh, statistical models when you don't know what data someone already trained on because they already have the answer at that location. And one of the great things about this EPA model is that they, they tell you explicitly which stations they trained on. You know what data they used as an input. And so we were able to compare our model and the EPA's model at stations that they didn't train on. And we refit our model without using those stations at all. So we wouldn't learn anything about the bias. We didn't peak, right? We don't, you know, we're, we're sort of um, able to have a head-to-head -head validation. And in this case, we are able to use uh, you know, in, in 2018, which was the most recent time that this uh, FAQSD was available, we, we were able to look at 310 sites across uh, the country, and, and many of those are reporting every day. Yes? So is this only the 2.5 or are there any other So this model um, is PM 2.5, and then I'll, I'll show um, uh, daily minimum, mean, and maximum air temperature, and then I'll hint at some future directions. Um, so when we make predictions from our model, because it can make point-based predictions, you make predictions wherever you want. When we make predictions that the same tracked centroids that they're that the EPA is releasing, right? They're making predictions to the centroids, um, and then you know we we have lower mean absolute error. The reason we use mean absolute error in, instead of mean squared error here is that air pollution concentrations have a very long tail, right? They, they're never negative, but sometimes they're very, very high. And so we think that absolute error is a, a more appropriate metric here. We have 16% lower mean absolute error when we average over all the years. And this is a metric I should say, you know, that's also reweighted to, to account for the entirety of the country, right? Because, you know, if a bunch of these ended up being in New York City, you don't just want a metric that applies to New York City. So we, um, we sort of use an inverse weighting that's related to the amount of area that each um, monitor is the closest to uh, using what's called a Voronoi diagram. And not only are we able to make the predictions of the same track centroids that they are, but we're able to make predictions anywhere we want, arbitrary points, you know, because we have these continuous fields built into our model. And there's several advantages of that. One is that we're able to get at things like um, being near a roadway. And the model has learned that when it's nearer to a roadway, concentrations are higher. And even though it's not a dispersion model, there's no physics in it at all. It actually, you know, we use some machine learning interpretation tools. We see that there's, you know, these strong gradients where the effect of being near a roadway dies off after just a few hundred meters, which is consistent with anyone who does, you know, monitoring on a transect around a roadway. Um, and so we're able to get at those kind of local effects. And we're also, as I said, you know, if you know where someone lives, we're able to make point-based predictions. So we also made predictions to the exact locations of those air, uh, of those air quality monitors that we um, were testing on. And then we're able to get even lower mean absolute error. It's even more improved versus the, the, the FAQSD. So this is kind of a decomposition right, of how much better do we do, you know, when we try to play their game, and then what's the improvement um, of having that local information of being able to drill down within a centroid, right, with, uh, sorry, within a tract, you know, not just assuming that everyone is breathing the air at the centroid, right? Some people will live, you know, on the edges, you have to pick, a, if you have to pick a representative place, the centroid isn't so bad, 
We also sometimes like the weighted population center that the census, uh, decennial census uh, produces. But I think this is a very cool kind of decomposition of the added benefit of, of not being as coarse, um, of having something that's sort of at the subtract level. And when we compare our temperature model with three popular gridded models, um, PRISM, which produces uh, and distributes a four kilometer gridded product, uh, GridMet, which um, brings in information from that NLDAS with, uh, with the information from PRISM, and um, DayMet, which is a one kilometer gridded product from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, what, what we see, uh, so here we, we did, you know, again, it's very hard to, to evaluate these because you don't know what people trained on. So we were able to get information from private weather stations, you know, from, from uh, potentially nerdy folks who set up a Wi-Fi connected meteorologic station in their backyard. And so we, um, we used some of that in our training, but we had leftover stations from the year 2014 onward. So we, we took a random draw of 10,000 of our extra stations that we hadn't trained on, we hadn't looked at them at all. And so we're able to compare these four models, um, ours, which is called the XGBoost IDW synthesis, ZIS, um, a, an underappreciated Greek letter, and we're able to compare our model with these three gridded models. And what we see is that we have a much lower mean squared error than each of these models. All right, I'm gonna try to speed up. Um, just as a visualization, this is a, you know, a very, uh, very warm day nationally. This was one of the warmest days in 2021. In the New York area, it was a pretty warm day. And here on the, on the left, you see the one kilometer day met model. And on the right, you see um, the kind of uh, map that we're able to produce you know, with ZIS, where we're, we're able to make um, predictions on any arbitrary grid that we want. So this is kind of going at a finer grid um, here to, to look at the variation. Um, so you have a combination of sort of effects that are related to uh, higher accuracy, and then there can be sort of resolution effects that I'll talk about in a second. So what are the implications of having, uh, of having better models? So one of the things that, that we looked at, and, and you know, Daniel really started this in our group, was um, looking at the relation between uh, these exposures and the CDC's social vulnerability index, um, which is a, a metric that's scaled from zero to one, uh, zero uh, being the lowest vulnerability, one being the highest. And it, you know, it's bringing together information across a, a number of different variables that the census has across a, a, a multitude of different domains. Um, and so we were interested, you know, here not in in any kind of causal relationship, but we're we're just saying what is the relationship between um, the sort of cross sectionally? How does temperature relate to social vulnerability? And we nested this um, analysis within counties because you need somewhat compact geographies so that you're not, you know, comparing sort of mountainous areas and and you know, okay. So we we fit a mixed effect model um, with county level intercepts and slopes. Uh, where, where we're looking at the um, relationship between social vulnerability index as our main predictor and the air temperature as our outcome. And what we found across all of the counties in that New England, this is using our one kilometer model first, um, what we found is that using our XGBoost based model here on the right, we saw a substantially higher um, difference in temperature on a, on a heat wave day. So we picked sort of the hottest midnight, again, um, going back to that nighttime temperature, much, much higher than when you use that coarser um, North, Adman North Atlantic, North American land data assimilation systems, because that's gonna, you know, even within an urban area, that's gonna lump everyone together, right? So, you know, Mount Sinai, right at the intersection of East Harlem and the Upper East Side, you know, but if you say everyone, you know, from the from the Hudson River to the East River is experiencing the same thing, you know, that, that's just not going to be true. And what we saw when we zoom in on just a few uh, specific counties looking um, within New York City or upstate, this is again from Daniel's paper, is that that, you know, that NLDAS, um, on the left, it just doesn't have the same variation in temperature, so it's not able to uh, accommodate, right? You have this essentially attenuation bias because you're assigning everyone the same exposure. When we look um, nationally, we've now done this with our ZIS model, the, the new national temperature model, and when we take um, a very, very hot day, uh, the, the minimum temperature on the hottest overall day in 2010, we pick that 
because we're going to pull some census data here. We do the same kind of analysis um, with this uh, mixed effect modeling. We see um, a difference of 0.69 centigrade Kelvin, right? And then these other gridded products are just substantially attenuated. And in the case of, of these temperature models, they're not as coarse as the PM 2.5 example, where the NLDAS is 11 kilometers by 14 kilometers, even DAMET, you know, one kilometer. So some of this has to do with, uh, you know, predictive accuracy and not just spatial resolution. Um, when we do this analysis with PM 2.5, we calculated the 2018 average at every centrist track. So we, we construct daily predictions and then average them for the year 2018. And what we find with, with our model um, is that the fixed effect associated with vulnerability is uh, essentially eight times greater than if you use the EPA's product. So um, we also, in collaboration, you know, we've done some pilot analyses with a colleague who was able to link our data to large mortality data sets, you know, and, and then sees that this attenuation bias, if you use other sources of temperature data, you know, you, you would underestimate the uh, exposure response function that we see for uh, extreme temperatures and, and mortality. So the theme there is that better exposure models reveal previously underestimated disparities and health impacts. Um, and so this is going to help us advance climate and health epidemiology. And I'll give you a few examples briefly of the kind of work we've been doing. Um, some of the original support for going national was to link these exposures with the NIH's environmental influences on child health outcomes study. And the hope would that be that using consistent exposure methodologies on these cohorts throughout the United States would help to um, you know, better link in these uh, significant environmental exposures with children's outcomes in a, in a number of uh, different health domains. Um, from, you know, from, from birth outcomes through you know, neurodevelopment and many things like that. So that was the original impetus for sort of scaling up our model to, to cover um, you know, this many years and, and this uh, large a geographic range. Um, in, in New York City, uh, you know, Mount Sinai has a very large um, biorepository with participants who have been genotyped. And so we were able to do some really neat gene environment interaction studies where we were looking at a risk allele in, in um, APOL1 that's related to kidney disease. And we saw this sort of super additive risk where having higher air pollution and this risk allele was worse than having higher air pollution or the risk allele alone. And, and in this case, um, we were looking at sort of longer term air pollution because we're looking at the incidence of this uh, chronic kind of um, kidney disease, the development of these um, very severe uh, out, renal outcomes. And um, a study that we just went live with last week is a new preprint um, in central Mexico, leveraging, uh, leveraging uh, publicly available records there and linking them into our, our updated Mexico City models where we're able to assign people exposures based on these sub-municipal areas where they live. And um, one of the focuses, uh, one of the points of focus of this study has been to think about um, cause-specific mortality, which is somewhat understudied uh, once you leave the cardiovascular domain for air pollution. So we see, um, you know, these associations, you know, we have this very large data set with, with 1.5 million deaths um, from 2004 to 2019. You know, we see these associations with um, hypertensive disease or, or with strokes or with chronic respiratory disease. And this has been well studied, but we're also able to look at these less well studied outcomes where we're seeing associations with, uh, you know, influenza, pneumonia, diseases of the liver, renal failure, and of course doing the popular distributed lag nonlinear modeling. So we're starting to try to tease apart um, what is the relative timing um, in the relationship between air pollution and, and mortality in this data set. This is work led by uh, Dr. Ivan Gutierrez Avila who's um, a postdoc at Mount Sinai. And, um, and then, you know, Daniel led some work because there was a question whether we could take these case crossover designs that are so powerful in environmental epidemiology and apply them to preterm birth, um, where the, the challenge there is that the risk of delivering preterm changes a lot as you get later and later into your pregnancy, um, the, the likelihood of, of delivering changes a lot, even over, you know, one month. And so um, Daniel led a simulation study of case crossover methods and whether you could appropriately reconstruct uh, 
realistic effect estimates in relation to temperature, you know, when you have this rapidly changing outcome. And, and what he found was that basically all the models were relatively unbiased. This is a, a short report in epidemiology that just came out last year. Um, and one of the fun things about this, you know, we, we want to apply these case crossover methods with preterm birth, and I'll get to that, is that this, this analysis was done um, using uh, sort of reproducible tools. One of them is the targets package in R, which is kind of an amazing tool for having this kind of reproducibility where you're able to get your exact same results back um, if you run it on, on a different computer or you, you start over from scratch. So that was a really fun project. Now we're linking to other large registries. So I mentioned in Mexico. Um, so the focus of my new ones proposal is to, is to connect to Sparks, which is a statewide hospitalization registry. Um, and so we're gonna be using our models to connect with uh, temperature, humidity, air pollution, and, and looking at uh, spontaneous preterm births. So thinking about uh, premature rupture of membranes and uh, preterm uh, early labor leading to these preterm births um, where we're able to go back in time. And you, you, know, you wouldn't be able to do this with a prospective study because if you wanna be able to go back in time, you, know, you, you just need to enroll way too many people for, for an outcome like this um, to, be, to be possible. So leveraging large spatiotemporal models and existing registries and health data sets is a really powerful approach to, to figuring out sort of what happened. Um, in future directions, I'm very excited about some of the new satellites that are coming along. This was a launch from last spring um, that, that put up uh, one of the satellites that's monitoring the West Coast. Uh, it's now called uh, GOES-18. And, and so this is what's gonna tell us about wildfires. It's gonna tell us about you know, um, some of the, the weird weather patterns that are being seen in the West. And some of that wildfire, you, know, you have long range transport of lofted aerosols that can come East and they can you know, down mix, they can influence our air quality here on the East Coast as well. So one of our projects is reconstructing um, humidity. So we're using column water vapor, which is um, one of the remotely sensed metrics that I told you about. And so we're, you know, this is still work in progress. We don't have our final humidity model yet, but we're really interested in the interplay of humidity and temperature. Um, many of the biometeorological indices that combine different elements, they, they were really developed um, maybe with occupational cohorts or, or predominantly, you know, um, older white male kind of folks. Um, and we don't know whether that's the right way to think about the, the physiologic impacts of extreme weather, you know, and, and who, is, who is susceptible. So we're really interested in the temperature and humidity as a mixture. Um, in this plot, you know, the color scale sort of reversed, the yellow is, is hotter here. This is using a newer product um, that's a higher resolution land surface temperature zoomed in on Mount Sinai. If you're not familiar with the location, uh, we're on the Upper East Side right next to Central Park. And here you can see this incredible hot spot in the right is, um, it's an MTA bus depot. So it's an asphalt covered building where they're just pumping heat uh, out through the roof, right? Because they have to have the ventilation for the buses and it just lights up. And on the left, we're able to distinguish, you know, the coolness of the Central Park Reservoir from the, the, the thermal signature of, of grassy fields versus forest canopy, right? So starting to drill down, you know, not from the one kilometer resolution, but really, you know, do I live in a building that is subjected to more heat? And that's gonna have really profound impacts when you think about, you know, people's energy costs and the equity of cooling, right? And that the distribution of where we have um, tall trees and, and green space in our cities is, is you know, horribly inequitable because of the legacy of residential segregation and structural racism. So being able to unpack that will help us to better assign exposures where people actually live. Um, we're gonna add uh, gaseous pollutants. I'm super excited about the Tempo satellite. I've been um, Tempo Instrument, which is going up on a satellite in April. I've been working with them for five years. So you wait a long time before the actual launch. Um, and so Tempo is going to scan North America um, and include even down to most of, of uh, Central and Southern Mexico hourly. And it's going to focus on gaseous pollutants, but also get um, aerosols. So this is going to be the first geostationary instrument, right? And geostationary means that it can take many scans per day. Everything is a mixture. We can measure many things from satellites. 
Um, this is going to have profound implications when we think about the human health impacts and, and where we go from here in terms of um, human health uh, adaptation. And um, of course, I want to thank my lab members, my current and former postdoc mentees. Um, and I want to wrap up. Thank you so much. And I'll repeat them. So the students have all some of the questions. Yeah, that's great. So many of us are carrying around devices that are tracking our time activity patterns. And so you could combine that particularly with something like you know, the hourly model where we start to say, where were you during the heat of the day? You know, in New York City, the, the population swells during the day. Or if you think about, um, you know, someone who, who works in the outdoors, uh, you know, a laborer, you know, the conditions of where they work could be very different than where they live. So I think there are many opportunities to leverage that kind of very uh, fine grain time activity data, um, you know, using things like GPS devices. Uh, there are also, some information on sort of average commute kind of patterns and where people go, um, the uh, flows and fluxes between communities. But I think you're right that there's a lot of opportunities to leverage that with individual level information um, in, you know, in health studies that have that or, um, you know, some of us have opted into letting uh, large corporations track us. Yep. Okay. Uh, is there any final last two questions? And my, my email's on the lower right if you have any questions. So um, thank Thanks. you. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, thank you all for joining. Thanks to our online audience for joining. And I do have a final uh, announcement regarding the seminar. So starting from next seminar, we will uh, add for the students, you, you will have a, like an opportunity to meet with the speaker uh, but, and would provide you know, this lunch. So, um, because many of you have a classroom, so uh, the, the current plan is we have five slots open. So please do uh, email me for registration. And we can we can see how that works and then we can modify that later. And thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks so much.